everybody to the ninth session where we are going to look into the fulfillment of uh, Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 completely and perfectly 2000 years ago by our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible writes in many places about the adversary Satan and about his representative here on earth the Antichrist. It does so at least in several books of Daniel, it does so in the epistles of Paul, and it does so in the book of Revelation, just to name a few. There are probably even more, but those are absolutely, without any question, places in the Bible where you can find writings about the Antichrist. Where there is not one word written on the Antichrist is in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is completely about Christ and the whole New Testament proves that Jesus Christ was the complete and perfect fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. From the very first verse in the Gospel of Matthew, when we speak about, uh, when, uh, when the Gospel speaks about the lineage, yeah, the bloodline that led to Jesus Christ. Until the very last verse in uh, Revelation chapter 22, it's all about Jesus Christ. And Tom and I, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me, Jörg from Hour of the Truth, came together today for the ninth session to share with you some parts of the New Testament, at least in the beginning some parts, and we will see how far this... Um, Study is going to take us that we maybe do much more than just a few, but for the moment we are in the book of Hebrews. We started last time Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 4, which I will uh, start reading to you in, in a moment after I introduced Tom to the broadcast who has joined with me together today. And then after the repetition, uh, repetition of the first four verses, we will go into verse 5 and going on. It has, I think, 80, uh, 38 or 39 verses in Hebrews chapter 10, so we are not going to finish that today. I can promise you that. That's absolutely an impossibility. But we will take our time because we don't care how many broadcasts this takes. We will show you that there is absolutely no denial that Jesus Christ was the utter and complete fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 and that the whole New Testament is testament of his working here on earth and of his working through the Holy Spirit the last three and a half years. 
Yeah, we have the 70th week of Daniel split in two parts, the ministry of Jesus Christ in the flesh, until in the midst of the week, as uh, it was prophesied, he went to the cross and he gave up his life, but not for himself, but for us. And then the continuation of Jesus Christ's ministry through the apostles, until then, the fulfilling of the 70th week was completely done, and then the gospel went to the Gentiles, which is the reason why Tom and I sit here anyway, because we are Gentiles. We are grafted in the vine by Jesus Christ through his grace, and now it really is time to let uh, my brother Tom Fress come to the microphone. Tom, I welcome you warmly to this ninth broadcast. I'm very glad that you're with us again. I hope your voice will hold out, and I'm very much looking forward to another wonderful session with you. Yes, hello everybody, and hello Yerk. It's a pleasure and a blessing to be here and to continue this study. Uh, yes, indeed, the 70th and final week of Daniel's 70-week prophecy is over. Perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago, and the New Testament is the virtual, infallible uh, recording of that fulfillment. Uh, nothing is to be added to the 70th week of Daniel. That prophecy and vision has been completed by Jesus Christ, have been rolled up and sealed. Okay? The, the prophecy says to, to uh, seal up the vision and the prophecy. That's what Jesus did when he fulfilled it uh, 2,000 years ago. So the 70th week of Daniel, despite what you're taught in all the churches today, the 70th week of Daniel is perfectly and completely fulfilled. There is no future seven-year period of time. There's no future 70th week of Daniel. There's no future seven years of great tribulation, like they say. There's no seven-year peace treaty to be signed by a future Antichrist uh, with, uh, with uh, the Jews to allow them to build a temple, begin animal sacrifices again. Now, I'm not saying that that's not going to take place uh, because the, the Vatican, together with the kings of the earth, are manually trying to fulfill their phony 70th week of Daniel. But it's not, it, it's not predicted in the Bible. Okay, It's not called for in the Scripture. What we've been taught about Daniel's 70th week and all this so-called future account of it is all a lie, every bit of it. Uh, either that or the New Testament is a lie. Because the New Testament testifies infallibly that the 70th and final week, that which pro was prophesied by Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, every jot and every tittle of that prophecy was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ. And I, and I know you've been indoctrinated from cradle to grave about some new uh, future fulfillment of it. I know you have been because I was. And everyone, every, every Christian that I've ever known knows about this uh, future seven-year period of time. Well, we're here to tell you, and we're here to prove by the Scriptures that it's all a lie that that 70th and final week of Daniel is over. And as many years as they have repeated this lie, we intend to repeat the truth, that the 70th week of Daniel is perfectly and completely fulfilled by Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. It was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Jesus Christ, Messiah the Prince, 2,000 years ago. And uh, so uh, what we do, what the, the purpose of this is, so that you will not be deceived by those who preach a future fulfillment, because if you believe in a future fulfillment, you're literally saying you do not believe in the historical fulfillment. That means you do not believe that Jesus was the prince that shall come. You do not believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th and final week of Daniel, because that was 2,000 years ago. They're telling us that the, 
that the future fulfillment is 2,000 years in, 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 in the future, or at least in our generation, or close to it. You see, if you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, you have to renounce the historicist 70th week of Daniel and thereby deny that Jesus was the Christ that Jesus came in the flesh, that Messiah came in the flesh. And what does the Bible tell us? That that is the spirit of Antichrist. That's what the Bible says. Okay? If you do not, if you do not believe that I am he, Jesus Christ said, you will die in your sins. Okay? If you, and the, it's the same as saying, if you believe that the 70th week of Daniel is future, you do not believe that I was he, spoken of by Daniel and the prophets, the one who confirmed a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. You're saying that you do not believe that Jesus was the he spoken of in Daniel's prophecy, and therefore you will die in your sins. You see, this is a salvific issue. And, and when people begin to grasp the consequences, what it really means to believe in a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, they begin to believe that this is a salvific issue. You cannot say that you, you believe in Jesus, Messiah, the Prince, out of one side of your mouth and say that the 70th week of Daniel is future because that's a direct contradiction. And we're going to prove that it's a contradiction by showing you in the scriptures the 1611 version of uh, the, the authorized King James Version. You, some of you may find it very difficult to read because of uh, the unusual spellings. It's not commonly used anymore. But uh, nonetheless, and uh, it's, it's supposedly the translation that we get from the uh, to get the uh, authorized King James Version, the 1769, of, uh, uh, whatever year it was, uh, they, they mo modernized it a bit. But they yeah, made 1769 Blaney Version is the other one called, Tom. Yeah, and that, but they made some changes they didn't tell us about. Okay, And that's why we're taking the trouble to read to you, to show you, and to read to you the authentic 1611. Uh, despite what they've told us that the 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 Bellamy version is just a, a, a modernization of the 1611. It does have some critical changes in it, and uh, so that's why we're burdening you with the 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 original authentic uh, authorized version of the 1611. But not to get into all that, I want I want the listeners to know the 70th week of Daniel was perfectly and completely fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come. Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Or Jesus was not the Messiah. You can't have it both ways. You literally cannot have it both ways. Now, I know your pastors are going to argue with this. Your pastors are going to try to cover this up. They've already spent since 1805 learning and teaching this lie. Since 1805 A.D., they've been flooding the churches with this nonsense. But nobody before 1805 ever heard of this nonsense, much less believed it. So who are we going to believe? The pastors of the last 100, 200 years, 250 years? or all Bible-believing Christians from then all the way back to the first century. The vast majority of Christians that ever lived in the world never heard of this nonsense, much less believed in it. And so we need to return to the truth, the historicist truth. And there's a benefit to returning to the historicist truth that which we are talking about this morning, uh, this afternoon, or wherever you're living in the world, and understand this is global. But what this does is open up to you a reality that has long been forgotten. And that is that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is not future either. 
Okay? Remember, in the future is the count of the 70th week of Daniel. They say it's the Antichrist that signs a peace treaty with the, with the Jews. Okay? We don't believe that anymore. We believe Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. Now, if there's not a future fulfillment, then there's not a future Antichrist to send us, sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, right? So then who is the Antichrist? Is he visible to us in history? And we find absolutely he was. And the Protestant reformers and all Bible-believing Christians prior to that time knew who the Antichrist was. They knew his face. They knew his name. They knew what he said and all of his blasphemies. They, let, they gave their life a virtual sacrifice in claiming that the papacy is the Antichrist. That's why they lost their lives in the first place because they openly testified that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition. And that's why the earth is soaked with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, because they would not uh, bend the knee to the pope. They would not attest, as the pope insisted, that he is the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, that he has divine sanction to rule over the spiritual lives of men, to rule over all the churches, the power to appoint all the bishops of the churches, and to also be the ultimate civil authority in the world, and that all the governments of the world must serve the pope and enforce his laws upon all mankind. That's what the papacy has claimed to be its divine right from the very beginning. King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what the papacy has insisted for all of its existence to do. To be the absolute, unchallengeable, king of kings and lord of lords, the governor of the world, as it were, the very Christ on earth, and the judge of every man, and no man may judge him. Okay? He has ultimate authority over heaven, over the earth, and over hell. And that's what the Vatican teaches even today. Heaven will never be your home unless the Pope grants you a key to the heavenly gates. You cannot uh, exist in this world, in this flesh, without the, without the permission of the papacy. Okay, You live at his pleasure, and you serve governments that serve the Pope. And then when you die, you have to go to purgatory. And it's the Pope who maintains the keys to purgatory. This is Roman Catholic dogma. To be a Roman Catholic, you must believe these things. And since the Protestant Reformation, we don't believe that anymore. The Pope is the Antichrist, the man of sin, the great pretender, the great counterfeit Christ. And that's what we've said and told to the world for 2,000 years. And we've been pursued and killed and persecuted and enslaved and disemboweled, had all of our longings be taken from us, our children separated from our wives. The earth is soaked with our blood. They, they, our names are written in the, in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. The persecution continues to this day. Anyone who contains, uh, continues to say that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, their blood will be mingled with those that, all, that, that have gone before us. That's the intent of the papacy today. That's the intent of all the governments of the world. It's the governments of the world that pursue us, persecute us, and implement the decrees of the papacy upon those who believe such things. Okay? I, I, I know we want to get to our study, but I don't want you to get lost of the fact of what we're literally talking about. This is, this is without a doubt, the most serious 
the most consequential lesson or discussion that you will ever participate in in your entire life. And that's not an overstatement. Okay? We're talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who deceives the whole world. That's what the Bible says. If you can't take this discussion seriously, then you ought not to listen. If you can't take this discussion seriously, you can't take your Bible seriously. If you can't take this discussion seriously, you can't take history seriously. Now, if you want to know the truth, the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth, that truth, that truth which will never be done away with, then continue to listen and see for yourself that the Scriptures, the New Testament Scriptures, testify that every jot and every tittle of Daniel's 70th week prophecy is over. The vision and the prophecy has been sealed up forever, never to be opened again. And what you're going to find is this futurism that they teach from all the Protestant, evangelical, and even Roman Catholic pulpits around the world, every so-called Christian church, has opened the seal of that vision and has rewritten Daniel's prophecy. And the purpose is to deceive all of Christendom and to get them to receive a false Messiah. That's what futurism is. To get you to deny the Christ that filled, fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. To deceive you into believing a future fulfillment of it that must be fulfilled by the Antichrist. And then a false Christ after he's destroyed. That is the whole purpose of futurism. It's a very creation of the Roman Catholic Church. It's provable, and that's what I've spent the last 20 years of my life proving. And uh, it's undeniable. Nobody can gainsay it. It's the truth. And so we won't just continue to say it's the truth. We'll prove it. Now, back to Yerk. That's what we're actually doing, Tom. We are doing a Bible study, and we are inviting everyone to join us in that study, and that we prove, because we don't study the Bible with church glasses on, but we study the Bible with God's glasses on. We will prove in the study that not only uh, Jesus Christ fulfilled Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago, but also that the papacy always was, is, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, prophecy, and history. And it is not only a, a, a study of a few verses or whatever what we are doing here. I think this is the most important Bible study for any Christian who calls himself Christian and who is caught in that, abomina in that abominable lie of futurism. Tom and I, doing this study we are reaching out to you and we want to help you to get out of that deception. Now we know that we will not have the success to reach anybody who watches these videos and to make them understand that in the light of the Bible we are talking the truth and the preachers and pastors and priests in your churches speak the lie. There are many people who rather feel comfortable with the lie. They have been indoctrinated in all life and they just won't, don't want to accept the truth. But the Bible also warns of these people. It is not on us to turn people. It is not on us to call people out of the church. God did that already in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. He said, come out of her, my people. What, what do you think why he wrote that? Because God knew that people with an honest conscience, with a God-seeking conscience, were to be caught in the synagogue of Satan. And nothing else is the Roman Catholic Church that we are putting on display here. Because the teaching that Tom said that comes from 1805, now in all the Protestant seminaries, comes out of the brothels of the Roman Catholic Church. It comes out of their seminaries. Their Jesuit-led seminaries. These Jesuits have made it their, prima, um, their, their prime objective to destroy Protestantism, uh, 
to destroy the word of God in the world and to take care for a one world global religion, one world global leadership of the Pope unquestioned because the Pope for them is the real representative of Jesus Christ here on earth. The Roman Catholic Church says in her dogma that she is a visible church and the visible church needs a visible head. Well, the Bible says, Jesus Christ said that his bride is here on earth and those are the Jesus following, Bible following, commandment following Bible believers. But the head is Jesus Christ who is invisible for us at the moment because he sits on the right hand uh, on the right hand of God in heaven for the moment that's why we need to have faith in Roman Catholicism you don't need to have faith because you see the Pope you see your God every day even on television we don't see our God but we know he's there and we are going to prove to you that Jesus Christ is the one and only correct fulfillment that ever took place of the 70th week of Daniel Thank you very much, Tom, for your very fine inauguration of our reading today, for the intro. And now I'm going to open this paper up, and uh, as I told you already, we have already uh, read uh, verses 1 through 4 of Hebrews chapter 10, but we are going to repeat the first four verses without any comment, and then continue in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. So now we are going to read the first four verses to get into the spirit again in this into this study. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once perched should have had no more conscience of sins? But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. This is verse 5 where we begin with. And also this one is a wonderful proof, once again, that Jesus Christ was the complete fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And we do not have to wait or we do not have to anticipate a future fulfillment of that. As Tom said, of course this future fulfillment, quote-unquote, fulfillment will come there, because that is the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, and they are playing their Jesuit theater in this world, and they want you to participate in that. We are giving you the choice not to participate in that. Yeah? Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. What does that mean? You know, the sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not lean to two things. First and for all, as way, the way that I understand it, they lead to the offer, to the offering that was asked of Abraham when he took Isaac to offer him, to sacrifice him, and of course to all the goats and sheep and bulls and doves and all other kind of animals that were killed in the temple, because with the shedding of their blood, the people were gaining the understanding that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. But no animal death can repay the sins of a guilty man. Only the blood of a man can pay for the sins of a man. And that's why Jesus Christ came. And he not only came for me, or only came for Tom, but he came for the whole world. He came even to die for the sins of everybody who even does not believe in him. And he knew it would be a very hard work to do. And that's why when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed to God, he said, If it were possible, let that cup pass myself, but not my will be done, but thou will, thy will be done. And that's the point. He submitted himself 100% to 
to the Father and did the will of the Father. And his blood once shed was the sacrifice and offering that the Father would accept. That Can body has now prepared comment? me. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not to interrupt. Uh, you were just very, doing very well there. I, I just want to uh, uh, remind the listeners that the Scripture plainly calls Jesus the second Adam. And it goes on to explain that whereas the sin of one man, Adam, death and sin passed to us all. Entered the world, yeah. Likewise, the sinlessness of the second Adam renewed us life and sinlessness through Christ. Okay? Sin and death entered in the world by one man, and so did eternal life and righteousness redeemed us by one man, the second Adam. Okay? Now, if you can understand that we fell into this curse of sin and death through the sin of one man, then you certainly can understand that we can pass into sinlessness and everlasting righteousness. Remember Daniel's prophecy? Everlasting righteousness through one man, the second Adam. Where death and sin came into the world through the first Adam, life, eternal life, and righteous, eternal righteousness came to man through the second Adam. It's just that simple. That's the message of the entire Bible. Jesus came to re rescue us from, from the curse of the Garden of Eden and the, 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 uh, the sinful Adam and, and, and give us a second chance. Okay, there's your second chance. And uh, Christ is the only chance for anybody in the world, ever in the history of the world. Jesus is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And while, like Yerk said, rightly so, he said it was the, the sacrifice of animals was to simply demonstrate there's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. But by the same token, no animal can, re the blood of animals cannot redeem man. Only the Lamb of God can redeem man. They were just foretelling the coming of Messiah. Okay? And uh, there's never been anybody in the history of the world that has ever been saved by killing a lamb or killing a goat or a bull or a dove. Okay? No flesh has ever been saved by the blood of lambs and goats. That's a hard concept because the churches don't focus on this truth. That's why God said their sacrifices were a stench in his nostrils. And he repeats it right here in this rebel in, in this in the in the book of Hebrews. That no blood of lambs and goats ever took away sins. The blood of lamb and goats only pointed toward the blood of the Lamb of God, Christ's only begotten Son, who ultimately would take upon his body the sin of the whole world. And uh, now that Jesus has been sacrificed, the sacrificial system has ended. Why, after Jesus Christ has literally taken upon his body the sin of the whole world and redeemed us to God, made reconciliation for iniquity, you know the story. Why would anyone ever go back to making sacrifices again? You've got to ask yourself, what Jew would ever slay a lamb or a goat or a pigeon or a dove? but the Jew who rejects Jesus as the Lamb of God. There's never been a more perfect way to demonstrate your rejection of Christ, but to make an animal sacrifice after Jesus has made the ultimate sacrifice, the once and for all, all-sufficient sacrifice for sin, made reconciliation for iniquity, brought in everlasting righteousness. So, 
if you want to know who is the anti-church, who is the synagogue of Satan, who is the Christ rejectors in the world, it is those who make sacrifice. And who are they? Now, those of you who don't want to know the truth, plug your ears, because I'm going to tell you. It's the Jews, the Christ-rejecting Jews in the modern nation-state of Israel who insist upon making animal sacrifices and the Roman Catholic Church that makes the sacrifice of the Mass every day. One calls itself Judaism. The other calls itself Christianity and the mother of all the churches when, in fact, she is the mother of all harlots. Okay, that which you thought was Christianity is not Christianity at all. It is the counterfeit church. It is the synagogue of Satan. And you don't want any emissary of the Pope, any representative of the Roman Catholic Church in your congregation. But now the ugly part about it is they've indoctrinated all your pastors through the seminaries. And they're preaching futurism to get you to believe in a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Because the truth is, the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. That's what put a permanent end to all sacrifices. Jesus, the supreme sacrifice, undid the curse of Eden. Undid the fall of Adam restored us to full fellowship with God in heaven and opened up an eternal kingdom that will never end, the head of which is Christ, and we are all his brethren. And the Antichrist has been a visible pretender for 1,700 years. And it's time for us to understand this and accept it as the truth. And tell our futurist pastors to shuffle off to Buffalo. Back to you, Nicholas, or rather, uh, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. I couldn't explain it in those nice words as you do. I always take refuge in a few pictures, and I think that the picture that you are seeing here on your screen that I already put in other videos before this one is just the one that says more than a thousand words. Tom can elaborate for two hours more on what he just did. I can do the same thing on two or three hours more. We will never be able to express it in a better way to show to your eyes what we mean when we say that by faith you are saved, not by the shedding of blood. It is the blood shed by the animals in the Old Testament that gave the people a, or that was for the the Israelites, a shadow of things to come. And that shadow was then that image that came, that was Jesus Christ. And we today look back at that image of Jesus Christ on the cross, spilling his blood for us. We look back because we, as I said in my little explanation, you know, the Pope being the head of the church, visible for a visible church here on earth, Jesus Christ is the invisible or invisible, sorry, invisible head of the church of for us in heaven. We don't see him, but by faith we know that he is there. We know that he did his work 2000 years ago because why why do we know it? Because it's written. It's written in the Bible. The Bible is the infallible in sorry, the infallible <laughs> sometimes I miss out my words here. The Bible is the infallible word of God. He tells us in that Bible, at least when you have a correct Bible, that's why Tom made the point that we are uh, reading the AV 1611 with the original 1611 text, not the falsified Blaney version and surely no other Bible that is based on Roman Catholic texts. When you have that true Bible, you have a perfect record of God telling you what was, was is what is and what is to come because that's what the bible is our guide through life that we have here it is 
our our um, how do you say that? our manual? The Bible is our manual for our life. God didn't just put us here and left us all by ourselves. He has an obligation to tell us, and he did in the book. And when we pick it up, we know that by faith we are saved, not by works. So, the offering of animals in the Old Testament, which is works, did not save the people. But the faith that the spilled blood of those animals are a shadow of the blood to come by Jesus Christ, that saved them. And we are saved not by sacrifices in the Roman Catholic Church or other churches or by any other way, but of the remembrance of Jesus' blood shed on the cross by faith. By faith are you saved, and that not of yourself, lest that any man should boast. We have nothing to do with our salvation. That is the biggest difference between the Bible teaching and the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is a works salvation and the Bible teaches faith salvation. Those are the unovercomable big differences between those two. You cannot have it a little bit of that way and a little bit of that way. You have to go all the way with one way. And our message is, Tom's and mine, in these videos, is go by faith. The true faith, the faith in the second Adam, in Jesus Christ, who came as man to this world in the same flesh as we are, as tempted as we are in his flesh, and you can read that in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, that he was tempted as we are, but he didn't give in to the temptation. He was sinless from the moment that he came to this earth as a man until the moment that he went to the cross and died on the cross as a man and shed his blood for our sins. That record, that Bible, is what we are going to study here. And that's what we come to again and again and again to prove to you by faith you are saved and that not of yourselves, lest that any man should boast. In my understanding, one of the most important verses in the New Testament. That, by the way, led to the five points of Calvinism. Huh? By grace you are saved through faith in Jesus Christ and um, uh, by the Bible alone, by Jesus Christ alone. Right? I don't know all these five points of Calvinism from my heart, but that's about it. Yeah? And those five points make a very clear standpoint. And that is absolutely 180 degrees opposite of the standpoint of the church here in the world that calls itself Christian, but that is not Christian. You can say you are good, but the Bible says by the fruits you will know them. So why should we even preach against the Roman Catholic Church's word when everything she does is clearly showing that she is the Church of Antichrist. You just have to open your eyes and to see it, and to understand it. And therefore, I suggest we go now back into the study of our little Bible study in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, except, of course, that Tom has something to say in addition to what I just said. No, it's very well. Continue. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Okay, we spoke already about that uh, when we explained verse 5, when I showed you this picture and we did our comments right there. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. If it is possible, let that cup pass me, Jesus Christ said in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he said, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Then I said, lo, I come to do thy will. It was the will of the Father, because we men sinned against God. 
and we could only be reconciled with God by the blood sacrifice of one righteous man. Now, since all of mankind sinned, there is not one righteous man except Jesus Christ. That's why he came. Then I said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Isn't that another wonderful confirmation of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, in the midst of the week? Huh? It says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. Well, okay, we're going to go into that a little bit later, not today. But in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And in verse 26, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. No, for him in the Old Testament and for him during the church age in the New Testamentical times. By faith, therefore, Jesus Christ came to be cut off. Jesus Christ came to offer himself as a sacrifice for everybody who believes in him. If you profess Jesus to be the Christ, if you profess that Jesus Christ died for you, and if you teach his name all over the world and be not ashamed of his name, then he will not be ashamed of defending you in the court before the Father in the time of judgment. Because that's what it's all about, as far as I understand the Bible. Because it says, for man is appointed once to die, and then the judgment. We will all have to stand before the Father in court. And then we need a lawyer. <laughs> and I want the only lawyer that can stand before the Father, and that is Jesus Christ. And I want him to stand in for me and say, Father, you cannot condemn your Father, you cannot condemn Tom because I paid the price, the ultimate price, with my blood for their sins. As it is written in Hebrews, I did your will, O Father. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin, thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Now we're speaking of the law of Moses, the Levitical law, the sacrificial law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now this is exactly what Tom was speaking about. He taketh away the first man, the one who sinned, that he may establish the second man, the second Adam, the one who paid the price for all the sins. So, the second what? Law? Adam? Yeah? The second Adam, to my understanding. I don't know if Tom can confirm my thoughts here in that regard. Well, certainly. I couldn't have said it better. He took away the curse of the first Adam. And now we're under the promise of the second Adam. Forgiveness of sin. Reconciliation for iniquity. Everlasting righteousness. Everything that Daniel prophesied of Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come. And uh, here in Hebrews... We're seeing in the New Testament the historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. This is the open testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Redeemer of the world, the end of sin and its consequences. Many people say, many doctors of divinity, the highest ranking theologians in the world will attest that Jesus never did claim himself to be the Messiah. Do you realize how asinine that, that statement is from the most 
studied men, biblical scholars in the history of the world, Christ constantly attested to his divinity and his messiahship. And uh, that's just how blind the leaders of Christianity are. And they should not be listened to. Well, Tom, they say that also, of course, because if they teach the people that Jesus Christ never said that he was the Messiah, they open up the abomination of a false teaching of another Messiah. That's right. It's a subject we've talked about before in, in, the, in the book of Matthew. Yeah, uh, when, the lineage. When, when, yeah. Well, that, certainly. And also the, 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 uh, the, the statement when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, looked at Peter and said, no, I say to you, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. And in those words, Jesus was attesting that he himself was the Messiah predicted by Daniel in chapter 9 during the 70th and final week of that 70-week prophecy. All right, there's no better way to just declare himself to be Messiah than to answer Peter the way he did. And what theologian, what doctor of divinity will ever tell you that? They don't comprehend it. They're not worthy of your listenership. And uh, uh, this is why all of Christianity has gone astray. We follow men. We don't follow the scripture. Okay? That was the problem that led originally to the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformers realized that they were following men and not the scripture. And they lacked understanding when they followed men. But when they came out of the Roman Catholic Church and away from the self-styled vicars of Christ, they read the scriptures for themselves in the, in the language of the people, in the language that they understood, and they realized, who is this Messiah the Prince? And uh, they knew their salvation was a done deal. They didn't no longer make sacrifices for sin. They would no longer participate in the Mass, the sacrifice of the Mass. They gave liberty and freedom to the captives that came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Do we have to learn all these difficult lessons all over again? Because that's exactly where these doctors of divinity the most celebrated names in Christianity today. That's where they're leading us. Back into Roman Catholic captivity to be subjects once again of the Antichrist. And they ought to be openly condemned. Any pastor behind a pulpit of a church that maintains this futurist belief ought to be openly condemned for his heresy. You say you believe in Jesus, you tell us to trust in Jesus, and then you turn around and tell us the 70th week of Daniel's future? You're a deceiver. You've confounded your own face. They need to be publicly punished, verbally chastised, shamed into oblivion for teaching these futurist lies. They need to be stripped of their titles, stripped of their power and authority, and if they're not kicked out of the church, they ought to be made to sit in the back row and keep their mouths shut. It's time for action in the churches. You, want, you, you, you see your country crumbling all around you. You see your country not governing itself, but seeking governance from the United Nations or from other foreign dignitaries, the main of which is the papacy. 
That's why this country is going to hell in a handbasket. And it's the duty, the moral responsibility of every Protestant pastor in this country to condemn that system of papal control. And I can't think of a better way to destroy the papal power in this country than to destroy the error of futurism in the churches. You want to turn this country around? You want to move mountains? Then you move the papacy and its teaching out of the churches. You want to make America great again? That's Throw it. out the Roman Catholic leaven. You take the papacy out of this country, lock, stock, and barrel, out of Congress, out of the White House, out of the, of the, the Supreme Court, out of the Federal Reserve Bank, out of this country, lock, stock, and barrel, and all of his futurist pastors right out with him and put Christ back on the throne. King of kings and Lord of lords, and there's no replacement for him. And then just believe your Bible and do what it says. No more sacrifices. Jesus paid it all. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And whoever you put to be your governor ought to first submit, lock, stock, and barrel to Christ and to obey his laws and take Roman Catholic canon law and burn it in the fire, just like Martin Luther did 500 years ago. And until this happens, don't expect peace and unity in this country. Don't expect peace and liberty. You can expect nothing but war and servitude. We've gone back to the Pharaoh of Rome. That's what we're doing. And we've been doing it ever since Vatican Council. I absolutely, let me correct myself. We've been doing it ever since we began to preach futurism in this country. When this country started to preach futurism, it was no longer a Protestant country. It was a Roman Catholic country, and that's not Christianity. It's the Church of Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan. And it's time for the pastors of the churches of this country to get it right or get lost. Back to you, Yerk. Get it right or get out, Tom. Let's continue in verse 10 for another few minutes in our study here. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Sorry, I added the end. Once for all. Yeah, okay. Once for all. Once for all. Pretty simple language, isn't it? I think what? there isn't a, 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 a verse we haven't read to, we have read today that is more clear about the fulfilling of the 70th week of Daniel than this one. Absolutely. So, so if it says once for all, does that mean we need to build a temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, begin sacrificing animals again? Do we need to pay for it? Do we need to fight war after war after war after war to make it even possible? Do we need to persecute the Jews beyond their ability to even tolerate in order to force them into this modern nation state of Israel that Christianity has created for them so that they may build a temple and eat and drink damnation to themselves? The Bible says in verse 10, the body of Jesus Christ wants for all. Does that mean that we need to make animal sacrifices again? Does that mean we need to go to the Roman Catholic Church and participate in the sacrifice of the Mass over and over and over and over again? No. It says plainly, simply, in English language, for anybody to understand, he says, 
by the which, that is his sacrifice, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ on the cross in the midst of the week, the last and final week of Daniel's 70th week, once for all. There you have it. There's your everlasting righteousness. I mean, it says once for all, right? It might just as, say, just as well say once for all men. It might say once for all time. Always, also. yeah. 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 So what, 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 what are all the Christians, all the so-called pro Protestant and evangelical Christians doing? Taking up donations, sending them to Israel so they can build a temple, so the Jews can eat and drink damnation to themselves. All right? They're Christ-rejecting if they make a sacrifice, and it's the Christians that are financing this abomination. They forgot that Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, didn't he? It says so right here, once for all. If yeah, he did it once for all, that means he put an end to all sacrifice. Did he not? This isn't difficult. This isn't like falling off a log or anything, is it? This is a lot simpler than that. But will your pastor tell you? Will your Protestant evangelical pastor tell you? No, they're ecumenical. They want you to renew, renew your relationship with the Roman Catholic Church to make us all one in Christ Jesus. They're making us all one under the Pope. They have no understanding. They have no eyes to see. They have no ears to hear. Their heart is full of lies and wickedness. Their hearts are full of Roman Catholicism. And they are leading us down the primrose path to perdition under the headship of the Pope. They give a a concept that they are all about unity and Christian peace and Christian charity and breaking down all the barriers between the churches and making us all one in Christ Jesus when in fact they're leading us down the primrose path of perdition and making us make sacrifice and oblation just like the Roman Catholics do. You can't walk into a Protestant and evangelical church anymore without somebody telling you in one way or another that what you're doing is not a memorial, as is told to us in the Scripture, but that it's a sacrifice. Speaking of the Eucharist. Speaking of the Eucharist. If they call it the Eucharist, that is a uniquely Roman Catholic term. It's ancient. It was part of the great falling away that Paul predicted. Anciently, they called it the Eucharist, and eventually it took, and not long after that, it took on the connotation of a sacrifice. Bloodless though it was, it was a sacrifice, a propitiatory sacrifice. That's not once for all. That's the opposite. And uh, that false teaching is uh, nigh unto 1,800 years old. And now it's crept into the Protestant evangelical churches. That's right. See it for yourself. Stay in that church long enough. And they're going to have to come out with it. It's a sacrifice, all right. And that's when you have to make a decision. At that point, you can't procrastinate any longer. You, to do so would, to be put to, would be to play fast and loose with your own salvation. Because if you make another sacrifice, then what you're telling God is that in Hebrews, where it says once for all, that's a lie. You're calling God a liar. 
You're calling Christ a liar. You're saying that Christ was not the prince that shall come. Jesus was not Messiah, the prince that Daniel prophesied. And at that point, you just as well believe, like everyone else, that the 70th week of Daniel is future. And follow your nose right down the, the yellow and white primrose path to perdition. Because that's where the whole Christian world is headed right now. You think I'm talking just to hear myself talk? That I like the sound of my own voice? That I like to be the center of attention? That I'm using loud speech in order to draw attention to myself? You know what? If I could do this perfectly anonymously, I would be just as zealous, just as, just as fervent in my speech as I am right now. You know what this speech is going to get me? The same thing it got every Bible-believing Christian throughout history. Nothing but grief. Nothing but grief. Rejection. Hatred. And that's what I've received from my own family for the last 20 years of my life. Doubt and suspicion. You ever walk into a room and hear a room full buzzing with conversation just go silent instantly? I hear it all the time. Nobody wants to be associated with a truth teller. That's because everybody maketh and believeth lies. Regurgitating the oft-repeated lies of the Protestant evangelical pastors in this country. Pastors in name only. Churches in name only. And they think they're Christian. Wrong. Dead wrong. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I would have so many things that I could add. But I think you made such a wonderful statement that there is not much to add. Just I want to end with one sentence. Everybody considers honesty a virtue, but nobody wants to hear the truth. But when you come to Hour of the Truth, and especially when I have Tom Fress as my guest on it, <coughs> you will hear nothing but the truth, the biblical truth. And if you don't like it, then go away. And if you like it, subscribe, come to our videos and study your Bible. Do what we have done to come to the truth. Because this is not something that has been given to us like um, breastfeeding, you know. It was by the grace of God. He called us out of our abomination. He called Tom out of his wrong church. He called me out of this world where I was caught in, in sins and abominations and wanted to have nothing to do with God because I didn't understand him. Why didn't I understand him? Because in the first place I didn't care and in the second place I listened to what man taught. And man's teaching did not make sense. The Bible makes sense. And if you think so too, that the Bible makes sense, then join us next time in the next part, the tenth part of our study, where we will further prove to you that the New Testament is undeniable, 100% proof of Jesus Christ being the complete and uh, perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago. In the meantime, don't listen to men. Study your word. Study the Bible. Maranatha. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track. i
punished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape.